from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I have the honor this evening of introducing Jeffrey Tubin, whose new book is American Heiress, The Wild Saga of the Kidnapping, Crimes, and Trials of Patty Hearst. Jeffrey is the author of six books. This is seven. This is seven, six previous books, and is a staff writer at the New Yorker magazine and the senior legal analyst at CNN. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School, where, as a longtime fan of his, I had the pleasure of hearing him address the law school's 2013 graduates, which happened to include my son, Alex. So adorable. <laughs> I love that. And with that not very humble brag, let's turn to your book, which reviewers have called riveting and a page turner. All true. Yes. <laughs> and have and have praised it for its nuanced portrayal of a truly bizarre cast of characters. Um, I'll just mention that we are going to leave some time within this 45 minute period, about 10 or 15 minutes, for audience questions. So please uh, start thinking of what you might want to ask. And there are standing mics around. Um, including, you could ask, about our current politics because we have an expert wit witness in our midst. Um, okay, so Jeffrey, let's start out by setting things up a bit for those who may need a refresher in the Patty Hearst story, may not know the details of this strange story from the 1970s. Would you please take us through kind of a bare bones version of what happened? Okay, thank you, Margaret. Hello, everybody. How's everybody doing out there today? Thank you for hanging in to the bitter end. Wow, am I, I I'm like too loud, but that's my problem, you I recognize. Definitely um, woke them up. I went, you know, it's just great, you know, it's just like 100,000 people, not here at this event, but 100,000 people come to talk about books in Washington. It makes you restore your faith uh, in humanity. Um, so thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here today. Margaret, thank you for being here. Okay. So I would like to start by asking a question which will help set this up. Is there anyone here who was alive in the 1970s? <laughs> there we go, beautiful. So, you know, I, I started working on this book and, I, you know, I was alive in the 70s, but I was a kid. I didn't have like a sense of perspective about the 70s and I sort of assumed that the 60s were the time that the country was full of tumult and craziness, but the 70s, everything sort of calmed down and chilled out. Could not be more wrong. The 70s were sort of an extended nightmare in the United States. It is astonishing to think about some of these things. One fact, a thousand political bombings a year in the United States during the early and mid 1970s. Think about that. We just had a bombing in New York I don't mean to minimize that at all. Try multiplying that times a thousand, and that's what it was like to live in the United States. Two hijackings a month in the United States. And the epicenter of the craziness was the Bay Area of California. And, and one, of the, one of the signal aspects of the craziness was this alliance between what was left of the counterculture and the prisoners, prison movement. There was this idea that prisoners um, would be sort of the vanguard of the revolution and there was this, key word here, symbiosis between the prisoners and the um, um, uh, uh, counterculture figures where they, they started working together. One place in particular, the Vacaville prison, which was outside, um, outside uh, Berkeley. A lot of students went there to visit, as it turns out, one prisoner in particular, Donald DeFries. Donald DeFries was basically a low to mid-level hood who sort of got caught up in this. He moves, he gets transferred to Soledad prison, escapes from Soledad prison in the mid-1973, gravitates to Berkeley because that's where these students were, 
And that is the birth of the Symbionese Liberation Army. He calls it Symbionese because it comes from the word symbiosis. They didn't liberate anything or anyone, and he called it an army even though it had about a dozen people in it at its peak. In late October of 1973, De Vries becomes obsessed with a figure named Marcus Foster, who is a, um, uh, the, the Oakland School Superintendent, African American, heroic figure, but De Vries becomes obsessed by him, decides and does assassinate him in cold blood on the streets of Oakland. At just that moment, Right afterwards, the SLA, such as it is, gets an infusion of, of reinforcements, three people, from the Indiana University theater program. <laughs> there are these three people, Bill and Emily Harris, who uh, decide that um, they are, are going to, you know, they like, like, let's like dial it back from the assassination. Let's kidnap someone. And they start making lists of people, corporate figures. And, uh, but then in early January, just by coincidence, there's an engagement announcement in the San Francisco Examiner. And the, uh, it's the engagement of Patricia Hearst to Stephen Wheat. Patricia Hearst is 19 years old. She's a, and, and it says in the fourth paragraph of the obituary, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Oops. sorry, not, not obituary. <laughs> an engagement announcement that, uh, that is like, don't, <laughs> don't even, even explore <laughs> yeah. that at all. The, <laughs> the, uh, my wife is here, I'm so happy that she's here, I don't mean that at all. The, the, um, it says she's an undergraduate at Berkeley. Emily Harris is a secretary at Berkeley. She knows that in that more innocent time, there is a directory open to the public of the home addresses of every student. So Bill Harris, Emily's, these are the two Indiana people, goes and looks up the home address of Patricia Hearst, 2603 Benvenu, apartment number four, and they start staking her out. And on February 4th, they kidnap her. And this is just her little apartment with Just her, her little apartment and they kidnap her. And be before I stop and ask, let you ask another question, I apologize for going on so long, it's important to remember that she is a Hearst. Yes. Now, if I might ask one more question of the audience, is there anyone in the audience who remembers what a newspaper is? <laughs> that's, uh, I know, I, I was afraid to make that's, that joke with you here, Margaret. That's I apologize. Okay, I've but heard you, it. You've heard it before. But um, the name Hearst, meant something different in 1974 than it does today. Because newspapers were bigger, richer, and more powerful, and there was no name more resonant and more powerful than Hearst in the newspaper business. So to grab Patricia Hearst, as Donald DeFries, Bill Harris, and Angela Atwood did on February 4th, 1974, was an, was an earthquake that is hard to parallel today. And that's what started the story. Okay. That was a good primer. Um, so, Jeffrey, the New York Times review of American Heiress by Janet Maslin, which was very favorable, by the way, called your account adversarial by definition. And she noted that Patty Hearst, now in her 60s, I believe, uh, is alive and a frequent participant in the world of dog shows. Um, but that she did not cooperate for your book. Was that surprising? Was it a problem? And is the book adversarial in your view? Uh, <laughs> well, um, Patricia Hearst did not cooperate. And we did have one conversation, so I, I, which I can quote in its entirety. I, um, <laughs> I, um, um, you know, I made many overtures to her directly, email, letters, uh, through mutual friends, um, I never got a response. So I figured, what the hell? I was getting to the point where I had to, you know, you know. And so I, I had a phone number. I called her up. I said, uh, "Hi, Patricia. This is Jeff Tubin," and she said, "Oh God, click." <laughs> so you know, I was getting these mixed signals from her about I didn't, you know. Um, but um, I, I, look, you know, 
the answer is, I don't consider the book adversarial. And this is an intro, I mean, I thought this was, I, all the other books I wrote, I've written, are book stories I covered in real time and then wrote a book about. You know, two books about the Supreme Court, The Recount in Florida, O.J. Simpson. Um, and this was a story for 40 years earlier that I, I knew very, very little about when I started. And, and it was really at the borderline of journalism and history. And, and the word that I kept thinking of as I was writing this book was tragic. And not in the sense of tragedy sad, but the sense of tragedy in the, in, the, in the Greek sense, in that people are prisoners of forces beyond themselves. So I, I did not at all view this book as like, I'm gonna nail Patricia Hearst, in, in the way that I might have a motivation about a, you know, a book about a contemporary event you know, to prove that I was right. So you know, yes, it is true, I draw different conclusions about Patricia's own behavior and the, the story as a whole, than she did, but I mean, like, I have no ax to grind with Patricia Hearst. I, you know, I, I, this is not a person I have any um, animosity towards. It's just, you know, I followed the facts where, where they led me. And it's not an unsympathetic portrait, no, I didn't think. No, I mean, and, and you know, the, uh, February 4th, she is, you, there are many things you can say about her, but the most important thing you can say about her on, 14, on February 4th, 1974, is that she's 19 years old. You know what, I mean, I don't think I am branding myself so much an old fart as to say 19 is young, <laughs> right? I mean, 19, hey, 19. is very young. Mm -hmm. and, and she um, was very unformed. The SLA did not know that as it happened, she was miserable in her engagement with Stephen Weed. She later described herself as mildly suicidal. Having met Stephen Weed, I can sort of understand. <laughs> but uh, the, um, you know, she was, um, you know, he was treating her like a sort of proto-housewife. At the same time, she was very alienated from her mother, not an uncommon thing for women in their teenage years, but her mother was very conservative, Southern Belle from California, from, from Georgia, who uh, disapproved of, of Patricia li living in sin, as the phrase was in those days. So she was kind of whipsawed between the principal people in her life. So she was uniquely vulnerable and restless at the moment she was kidnapped. Mm. So there is a famous photograph of Patty Hearst, that many of you have seen and can conjure in your minds, wearing a beret, and she's in a kind of a combatant's stance and she's brandishing an automatic weapon. And uh, it became an iconic image. And your, your phrase for it, which I love, is a Mona Lisa for the 1970s. So um, is that your phrase? It, yes. Mr. Tubin? <laughs> I didn't uh, take that for me. All right. Um, it's a great phrase, Thank and I you. wish you could explain to people exactly what you mean by Okay, that. well, let me just, this requires a little uh, setup here, but. Um, she's kidnapped on February 4th. The SLA puts her in a closet at first, but in short order, the, the closet door opens and they start talking to her. One person in particular, Willie Wolf, who is of the eight kidnappers, the eight people in the SLA at that point, the most similar to her in background, class, son of a physician from Connecticut, prep school guy, went to Berkeley, archeology span student for a while, and they start to hit it off. March 31st, she sends a communique, a tape that says, I have decided to stay and fight, and my name is now, and I bet there are people here who remember this, Tanya. Tanya is uh, the name, the nom de guerre of the woman who was um, uh, Che Guevara's partner in the jungles of Bolivia. And, and you know it's a, it's a, and on April 15th, um, the they uh, SLA the eight of them rob a bank, the Hibernia Bank in San Francisco, and they pick that bank because um, it had a relatively new innovation at that point, which was a security camera, and they wanted Patricia photographed in front of the camera. Because, and this is where the, the Indiana people really, they wanted to show, they had a real concern for PR and showmanship, 
And so they put Patricia in, in the bank where she would be photographed. That bank robbery is actually a big success. They get about $15,000, they go back to the house, and to celebrate, they take two portraits. Um, the, uh, there's a group portrait, but the more famous portrait is of Patricia herself. And, and she's standing in front of the, the flag of the SLA, which is a seven-headed cobra, and she's there with an expression on her face that I believe is correctly described as inscrutable. Mm -hmm. And I think it, the, 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 the photograph serves as a great metaphor for the whole story and frankly for the mystery at the heart of the book because you can look in that photograph and say, she's terrified. You can look in the, and say, she's thrilled. She's, t she's happy, she's sad. It is, a, it is a mysterious expression on her face and, and, you know, and that's the, the mystery at the heart of my book, which is, is she really part of the SLA or just coerced? And the photograph displays that mystery in a, in a Mona Lisa-like way in that it's just hard to tell. Why does that photo endure so much? Is it the mystery at the heart of it? Well, it's also a badass photo. It is. I, I mean, you know. <laughs> There is part of, of the She's a very good looking woman for she, one thing. She is good looking, but it, it is also, you know, a part of the story that, you know, the counterculture was a real thing. Yeah. And, and, you know, it is true, thank goodness, that most people in the counterculture were not assassinating school superintendents, but they were very angry. I mean, there, there was, you know, you know th this was not just, uh, you know, the 70s, were also the time of Watergate and the energy crisis. I mean, the country was in bad shape. Vietnam was not yet over at that point. And, and there were people for whom rebellion was a very appealing thing. And here you have this rich, rich woman, you know, with a machine gun. I mean, a lot of people thought that was kind of cool. <laughs> and, 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 you know, that photograph, you know, she's got a swagger about her that was captivating to a lot of people. So, so it is not, uh, I mean, I, I, you know, it, it's just a quirk that Ms. Moon Soltizic, who was one of the kidnappers, happened to snap this. It's a Polaroid picture. I mean, it was a, you know, crappy camera. The group portrait mm. is so bad you can barely tell who's who, but it just so happened she caught Patricia at this mysterious moment that served as a great metaphor for the whole story. So robbing a bank was not the worst thing that the SLA did. No. Tell us about that. Well, um, see, this is where I learned the most in the, in the story because, you know, I was aware that she was, she robbed that bank and I, th there's an almost as famous photograph from the security camera with her and the machine gun in the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, but, um, what, what happened was, the bank robbery is April 15th. The heat starts to get really bad in, in, in San Francisco, so DeFries directs that the nine of them, the eight kidnappers and Patricia, they all go to Los, they all decide to go to Los Angeles. They rent a small house in uh, South Central LA, and then they sit there and they start to go stir crazy because they, as usual, the SLA had no real plan. They were just sitting there. So one day, May 16th, Bill, Patricia, and Emily, uh, Bill Harris and Emily Harris and Patricia decide to go shopping. And they take a van and they go uh, to a grocery store, then they go to a newsstand, and then they go to buy some clothes at a place called Mel's Sporting Goods. And Bill Harris, parks the van on, on, a, main, on a main street in, in, in Los Angeles, across the street, four lines of traffic from Mel Sporting Goods. Bill and Emily go inside. Now, just picture the scene. Patricia's alone in the van. He is in the ignition. She could drive away. She could walk away. She could call the police. She could go home. She does none of those things. She waits for Bill and Emily Harris. Now, Bill, goes inside the, the store, and because he's a genius, he decides to shoplift. <laughs> so 
Good move. He shoplifts, starts stuffing stuff in his butt. Now, as it cr just so happens, one of the, one of the um, clerks is an aspiring police officer, Anthony Shepard. And Anthony Shepard knows that the crime of shoplifting does not actually take place until the person leaves the room, leaves the store. So he sort of keeps an eye on Bill, watches Bill leave without paying, then jumps on him on the sidewalk. Emily jumps on Anthony. Bystanders jump in. It's a melee in front of Mel's Sporting Goods with Patricia across the street. What does Patricia do? Does she do nothing? Does she drive away? No. Patricia goes into the back of the van and gets a machine gun, <laughs> fires it out, takes it out the window, and sprays Mel Sporting Goods with an entire magazine of bullets to free Bill and Emily. Doesn't work. So she gets another machine gun <laughs> and fires it out the, through the, the glass. Again, miraculously not hitting someone. Um, and um, that succeeds and gets Bill and Emily free. The three of them get into the van. They realize that this has drawn a good deal of attention. <laughs> so they decide not to go back to the house with the other six in it. Emily has had a summer job a few years earlier at Disneyland. So the three of them go to Disneyland, <laughs> where they check into a motel, and they turn on the television, and they see that the LAPD has surrounded the six comrades. In, 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 in this house. And what follows on live television is the biggest shootout in American history to this day. 5,000 rounds of ammunition go in to the house. 3,000 rounds come out. The house is enveloped in flames, and all six people inside are killed. Donald DeFries, Willie Wolf, Ms. Moon Siltisic, all of the SLA, four women and two men and Bill and Emily and Patricia are watching live on television. What follows from May 17th to September 15th of 1975, almost a year and a half, is what's known as Patty's Lost Year. They rob two more banks, including one where a woman is killed. Um, they set off bombs in the Bay Area. That's the crime spree that she's participated in. So. Jimmy Carter commuted her sentence, and Bill Clinton pardoned Patty Hearst. As a legal analyst, how do you see these examples of clemency? Were they justifiable? OK. So she's arrested on se September 15, 1975, a year and a half after she's kidnapped. She is charged with the original bank robbery, the, the Hibernia bank robbery, not the two later bank robberies. Effley Bailey defends her, big celebrated trial. She's convicted and sentenced to six years in prison. Um, the Hearst family mobilizes um, a real political campaign to get Patricia sentence commuted. A very important intervening event is another event, another example of San Francisco madness. The Reverend Jim Jones, I, a nod of recognition, I'm so pleased, uh, <laughs> and the People's Temple, he takes th his group of followers to Guyana. They commit mass suicide. 900 of them drink poison Kool-Aid and kill themselves. It's funny, you know, people today talk about they drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> Most people don't even know what the right. reference is, but it's to the Jim Jones uh, mass suicide. Um, that creates this national conversation about, like, why do people do stuff that is so much against their self-interest? Mm -hmm. In this environment, Jimmy Carter commutes her sentence with the support of Ronald Reagan, his political rival, after 22 months. But that's not enough for Patricia Hearst. 20 years later, Bill Clinton is in his final days at the White House, and he gets this application from the Hearst family for a full pardon, long after she's committed her, completed her prison sentence, and, she, and he grants the pardon. Of course, he was on a pardon grant. Right. It, it was the same day that he pardoned Mark Rich, his brother Roger. The uh, remember that? Yes. 
Good times, Clintons are back. <laughs> We're gonna have all that stuff come back. It's gonna be great. Um, the, uh, um, she's the only person in modern American history to receive a commutation from one president and a pardon from another. And if you want an example of how wealth and privilege helps you in America, this is one. Thank you for that ovation from two people. Uh, the, um, no, but I mean, there are a lot of people in prison who get mixed up with bad people and they make mistakes and they like do stupid things. They're not getting any commutation. They're not getting any pardon. And they sure as hell aren't getting both. But she, she did. Yeah. Now she's going to dog shows. Now she's, uh, excuse me, she's, she's participating yes. in dog shows. Yes, yes. So you have written about O.J. Simpson in your book, The Run of His Life, which you may have read, but if you haven't read it, you've seen the FX series that followed more recently. It was very popular. Uh, another celebrity who got in serious trouble with the law and uh, another whose defense included F. Lee Bailey. More successfully. Yes. Yeah. How would you compare the two trials and the legal aspects? Well, you know, it's a, one of the, um, you know, th this has been this sort of weird, re you know, this, the O.J. story has sort of come back and, and it, a pop culture phenomenon thanks to the FX series and the wonderful documentary that ESPN did. Um, and, and, you know, they are all, all of this is like 20 years apart. You have um, 1974, the kidnapping, 1994, the OJ case, you know, 2016, roughly, the, um, the this. So, I, you know, I've had occasion to think a lot about the news media in connection with all this. You know, people w talk about the, o about the Hearst case. They say, oh my God, there was so much publicity. It was like, the, it was like you know, she was on the cover of Newsweek seven times. And people today are like, what's Newsweek? <laughs> and what's a cover? <laughs> um, and, and, and the OJ case was at a moment of cable news arriving on the scene. The gavel to gavel coverage on CNN, on Court TV, but pre-social media, pre-internet. And, and, and today, you, you know, you have a completely different news environment. Um, the, the trials, I think, reflect, you know, they, they all reflected what was going on in the society. First of all, they all reflect a venerable American truth, which is it's better to be rich than poor. Um, they also reflect sort of that trials, especially high profile trials, reflect you know, the political environment in which they're, they're taking it. One reason why there was a lot of hostility to Patricia at her trial was that this was a time when, you know, what was then called the silent majority was like, why do we, these kids, why are we indulging these kids, you know, rich kids who want to go shoot up streets? I, I mean, you know, the, the, she was not the figure of sympathy that in many respects she is today. The OJ case, as you know, I certainly explored in my book, and the FX series did brilliantly, you know, reflected the tremendous history of antagonism between the African American community in Los Angeles and, and the police department. Um, and, and I think one reason why OJ was such a resonant story in 2016 was because we are now in a world of Black Lives Matter and Ferguson and Tulsa and Charlotte. I mean, you know, all of these stories, um, you know, ma made that story seem very fresh. So in, in that respect, you know, the, especially these high profile trials, they are very much part of the broader national dialogue. So I have many more questions, but I wanna uh, at least, yes, let us, um, Let's open it up, and while you're getting to your mics, I will ask you about my favorite one of your books, which is Too Close to Call, uh, an examination of the 2000 election uh, between George W. Bush and Al Gore, and its drawn out aftermath. Looking at today's presidential campaign, is it possible that anything similar could occur? Uh, has anything happened to prohibit that? 
Well, um, speaking of my books, you know, I, I am not going to retitle my book The Nine, The Eight, <laughs> but that's what we're, you know, <laughs> at, at the rate we're going, it's going to be pretty long. It's, it could be quite a while. No, because this is not going to be a close election. Hillary Clinton's going to win this election fairly easily. <laughs> that's just a prediction. <laughs> that's just a prediction. That's not an advocacy position. Uh, but I, I just, I don't think this is, you know. Uh, it will it, not be too close it, it to will call. Not, it will not be too close to call. W what remains true, and, and what, what is interesting uh, in, in, about the aftermath of, of um, the um, recount is that it alerted the, the, the political system to the political nature of the electoral process itself. That the, Id you know, the voter registration, at least the mechanics of it, certainly, you know, voter registration was a key part of the Voting Rights Act, but, but the mechanics of voter registration had sort of become relatively uncontroversial until 2000. And particularly the Republican Party saw the advantages of using the electoral process to its, to its advantages. And one thing we, we have seen, you know, particularly since all the Republican landslides of 2010, were these efforts to you know, limit the franchise and limit the people who vote Democratic. Mm -hmm. you know, limit early voting, limit absentee voting, um, you know, establish photo ID requirements. You know, in, in the state of Texas, uh, a gun permit is a legitimate form of identification, but a student ID is not. Now, who do you think that helps, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, th th this, this really began, I think, with um, the, the recap. Thank you very much. By the way, full disclosure, I lived next door to Nicole Brown Simpson. So you and I could have a very interesting conversation. Oh, we're on Bundy? Yes. Oh, wow. Literally. I had, rose, I had flowers and cards for them at my front door. Um, why do you think the lawsuits against Trump University and the shenanigans with his, uh, the foundation money and all of that and all of these other, the, the plethora of the abundance of lawsuits and, and challenges to, to Trump's integrity that have, have been legal have not really generated the media coverage and the depth of media coverage that um, other like crimes or in like charges usually do? False equivalency. Go for it, Sullivan. <laughs> no, no. No, you, come you, on, no, you're no, the press you, critic. No, come no, on. you go I, ahead. You're the star. It's a hard question. You know, I mean, it, you know, it is not the case that, you know, Trump's various misdeeds have not gotten a lot of attention. Your question illustrates it. Um, you know, I, I participated in CNN um, discussions where John, where he said, you know, J John McCain's not a war hero. He's, you know, I, I like people who weren't captured. The whole notion of gaffes as defining moments, in, I mean, you know, the stuff he has said, we like, can't even keep track of all the crazy stuff he has said. Um, he has managed to, f to, to float above this. And, you know, it, it is true that I think for many months he was treated more like a curiosity than a full-fledged candidate. And I think he benefited from that a lot, especially in the Republican primaries. But it is also the case that, you know, there has been a lot of detailed searching scrutiny to his business dealings and you know, and, and, and you know, obviously I think Hillary's gonna win, but it's obviously a very competitive election, and, and I, I don't know. I, I, I wish, I mean, that is a big part of this election, and I don't really understand why he seems to be immune to the laws of political gravity the way others have been. It's a pretty good answer, isn't it? Very good. Oh. Uh, I have a craft question that may interest the audience and journalists like myself. You write really superbly researched, in-depth reported books continually. You're very high, productive, and prolific. 
how do you manage to do that in the court? Is it because even when you are covering, let's say, the Supreme Court, and then you do a book like The Nine, it has way more depth than what you were covering in The New Yorker, and you are a, a, a regular guest on CNN, a New Yorker correspondent, and a book author. Do you like work like 19 hours a day or have a word Definitely count per not. day? <laughs> okay. First of all, thank you. Second of all, I'll give you two answers, two, two reasons why I get things done. One is when I write a book, I am on leave from The New Yorker, and I thank David Remnick, the editor. I cannot write New Yorker stories and write a book at the same time. So don't think, you know, that's not in the 19 hours a day. Um, the second reason is extremely simple-minded. When I have completed, more or less, not totally, but more or less completed my research on a, on a book, I write five pages a day. I write 1,250 words a day. Now, I, you know, th that, to me, I don't know about you, but to me, the single easiest thing in the world to do is not to write is to say, well, you know, I'm like, going to do research today. I'm going to do edit. I am disciplined about writing 1,250 words a day, which, you know, five double space pages, which is not an unreasonable amount of a day's work. But, you know, it's 25 pages a week. It's 100 pages a month. It really does add up. And you get a book. And I don't write these doorstop books. You know, these books are a reasonable, you know, 300, 400 pages. Um, you get a book in six or eight months. So I, I, that is the way I, fo now I often go back and rewrite. I, I, it's not like this stuff is set in stone. I do a lot of editing, but a, to me, the hardest thing in the world is to write a first draft. Anything is preferable to writing a first draft. That's why I force myself to do it. Well, thank you so that much for your discipline and your hard work. We really thank appreciate you. it. Let's go back over here. In uh, the, the aftermath of the 2000 election, uh, it's somewhat remarkable how well the country was able to heal from such a traumatic uh, electoral experience um, with, you know, potentially a, that's because Al Gore conceded arguably early or, or, or however you, your opinion on that. If a similar situation happened now uh, in 2016, um, while I agree with you that it's unlikely that the math would work out in, in such a way, but uh, are we approaching a point where there's no longer going to be this general kumbaya of, okay, well, that was kind of rough, but let's get back together, believe in the, uh, the rule of law and our system of government. Is that starting to crumble? Do you have one candidate in mind who might <laughs> be like a little, uh, you know, I, look, um, you know, I think Al Gore really thought, and I correctly, that he was committing a patriotic act by saying, it's over, let's be done, we only have one president at a time. It is true that Donald Trump does not have a history that would suggest a similar kind of graciousness. <laughs> I kind of like that sentence, uh, the way I said <laughs> that. That is true. Uh, and it, it, wouldn't you say it is it's true? Tough. Graciousness is not necessarily the first word that comes to mind <laughs> when you think of him. So, um, I don't know. I, I mean, you know, probably this will, this will not be, uh, you know, a, a contested election. But, you know, every time he lost a primary, he said there was cheating involved. Remember? So, buckle your seatbelt. Let's go back over here. Hi. I'm curious about your fact-finding process behind the Patty Hearst Project, especially since she wasn't willing to do personal interviews. Did you rely on a lot of public documents? And if so, were those hard to get? Um, the, uh, I, I, we're, we're running out of time here. Um, the, there were, there's a lot of public documents, starting with the transcript of her trial. Also, you know, she wrote a book about her experience, so that was a very good place to start. She also testified at her trial and testified in grand juries. Um, Bill Harris, who was one of the SLA people, later went on, when he wasn't in jail, became a private investigator. And a, and a rather good one, and he, he's an enormous pack rat. And he had collected 150 boxes of material, other court cases, FBI documents, SLA material, uh, literally 150 boxes, which he was about to sell to a university library. It fell through. I bought it from him. And in addition to 
interviewing about 100 people who were still around. I was pleased to see that 40 years later, a lot of the protagonists were still alive, including F. Lee Bailey, including the prosecutor, um, who sadly died after I interviewed him. But uh, No connection. Why are you laughing at that? <laughs> Terrible. Uh, no, he just died. He was old. I mean, you know, uh, it was Not sad. Uh, but um, the, um, so, you know, I, I just approached it. I got inhaled and assembled everything I could. Let's do one more question right here. Mr. Tubin, do you feel a responsibility as an analyst on television not to be even-handed when one candidate is lying all the time and the other candidate is capable of having some problems in what she says? So uh, <laughs> how do you approach your colleagues and to make sure that you're not even-handed given the craziness of this election. And by the way, could you please write a book about this election? No, yeah, no, there, there are going to be so many books about this election. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like, I'm seeding the, the, seeding the ground. I, you know, this is one of the most difficult journalistic questions that's been asked about this election. And Margaret has dealt with this in a more learned way, an experienced way than I have. But the issue of false equivalence, and it's not so much the, um, any individual story in terms of, you know, are you being accurate about this story versus that story? The question is really what you're covering. In many respects, the most important question about journalism is what stories you cover, not so much what you say about them. And if you do daily, daily coverage about Hillary's emails, in daily, daily coverage about the Clinton Foundation, even if you're accurate in each sentence, you say you give the impression that it is equivalent to Trump University and all, all the rest of that. And that is a very hard question to address. And, and I think in our profession, that is going to be the biggest after the fact um, question we all have to wrestle with. And, 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 you know, first of all, I'm hired help. I'm not an editor. I'm not a producer. I, you know, obviously, I have control over what I say and what I write, but I am not someone who, you know, decides what's being covered. And I think that's, that's been an area that we're going to have to do some real so soul searching about. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Jeffrey Tubin. Thank you, Marvin. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.